Hello everyone and welcome to Planetech's launch event. My name is Uriel Klar, Director of Planetech, the innovation community for climate change technologies. I'm extremely excited to be here with all of you to build a community for people that share a passion for the environment and technology and want to take action. At today's event, we will hear climate leaders sharing their vision for climate tech in their countries and presenting opportunities for innovation and funding programs. We've collected the most asked questions from the registration forms and presented them to our speakers. Due to the COVID situation, we have pre-recorded the event to ensure all speakers will be able to participate. You're invited to ask us questions during the event with the chat function. We will be live at the end of the event to answer you and share information about our future activities. So without further ado, I would like to start the event with the opening words and greetings. Please welcome Gila Gamliel, Israel's Minister of Environmental Protection, to share with us her opening notes. Distinguished colleagues and friends, I'm very proud to be welcoming you to this first event of the Planet Tech community and to thank the Israel Innovation Institute for their organization and for bringing together an impressive list of speakers and supporters. COVID-19 presents us with a singular opportunity. Increasing numbers of world leaders recognize that now is the time for massive investments to combat the existential challenges of climate change, ecosystem degradation, and biodiversity loss. For climate change in particular, this is the last decade in which the world can still act to prevent the catastrophe of extreme temperature rises. Countries which fail to act will soon be left behind. I deeply believe that Israel must not just keep up with the green transformation. We must lead the way. Israel must become the international focal point for climate change technologies. We must lead on three levels, the level of policy, the level of innovation, and the level of international collaboration. On the level of policy, we must not be afraid to set bold goals domestically. I believe that Israel must reach 95% renewable energy by 2050 and an 85% reduction in emissions by that same year. The government resolution and climate legislation I am advancing would create for the first time a whole of government approach to this whole of planet crisis and would require polluters to pay for the true cost of their actions. I'm proud of the fruitful relationship we have developed with many in academia, the private sector, and civil society on the level of policy. However, public-private cooperation will be even more vital on the levels of innovation and international collaboration. That is why Planetech is so important. By supporting open innovation, Planetech can help ensure that a green revolution does not come at the expense of economic growth, but that it is the engine of economic growth that leads to a greener and healthier future and leaves no one behind. We will be building on the expertise and technologies Israel already has and on our tradition of investment in research and development and turn this to solving climate challenges. For example, my ministry continues to invest together with the other government partners in setting up an innovation laboratory and pilot facilities for clean tech startups to help ideas become marketable. Planetech's vision is to function as a massive network of all players in the climate tech ecosystem. By serving as an international hub, just like the Desert Tech, which is dedicated specifically to desert adaptation technologies, and is supported by my ministry. So too, Planetech can promote strategic partnerships with the countries of the region, with the developing world and with our friends and allies. Dear friends, I am committed to ensuring that the cooperation we are celebrating and supporting here today will help lead the way through technological creativity to a better and more sustainable future for our countries, our peoples and our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Gamliel. We will move on to Mr. Vincent Chinghiz, Chairman of Consensus Business Group, one of Planetech's partners, to share his opening notes. Hello, everybody. I'm Vincent Chinghiz, uh, 
chairman of uh, CPG Group. Wish you all well. Basically, I thought I'll give you a few words about uh, myself and the group CPG. We're a private group based in the UK with activities all over pretty much a lot in Israel, United States, Europe, and uh, England. And our activities uh, basically were a $1.2 billion group. I have developed the business from uh, the early 90s, 80s, and then 90s, all the way from foreign exchange trading, capital markets, and moved on to discover and arbitrage, where I was able to securitize the, the market in uh, property on cash flows. I developed a financial model which allowed us to acquire around 4 billion pounds of property. And then after that, into in the past 15 years, I decided in 2000, early 2000, the markets I was looking at, I started investing in technology, and particularly I got interested in climate change, where I realized that this could be uh, some phenomena that I saw it to myself being in South Africa, where I realized I've lost the beach in South Africa, so I realized this thing is for real. Then I decided to develop a financial model around climate change in early 2000. We subsequently invested in the year 2006. I created a, a fund called Inspired Evolution in South Africa with the IFC, World Bank, as an investor together with Africa Development Bank, European Investment Bank, and a number of European, Finland, Norway, Swiss fund. So I created a $100 million climate change financial model at that time, and then went on to develop a fund with Abu Dhabi government called Mazdar, which was a clean tech fund of around $250 million. Subsequently, a further Africa fund we participated three, four years ago, which was 250 million in Africa, investing in projects to do with the solar and wind and climate change, basically, as well as uh, an investor in biocarbon fund with the World Bank in investing in deforestation and reforestation. And at the same time, I started to look at the carbon markets to see how they develop and how they flow. So from then on, we've moved on to invest in healthcare, and we have a substantial portfolio, particularly in Israel, across a dozen venture capital groups, VCs, and uh, around $400 uh, million dollar invested and a lot of investment with the hospitals, so with a number of Israeli hospitals. Trendline Incubator, which is both healthcare and agri-tech, and Capital Nature, which is a clean tech, the first and only clean tech incubator in Israel, where we have 12 technologies, all clean energy, which started in 2010. We now see the companies that have listed from that area, Electrion in road technology, developing roads in Germany and Sweden, in a new, uh, new generation uh, energy from the roads, together then with Ogwind. Actually, it went public at around, circa trading at around a billion dollars. Ogwind, which is a company in compressed air, the a new technology uh, working with a number of industries and separately now they've developed energy storage and working alongside solar parks. So that's uh, currently being piloted with EDF and the EDF being the largest renewable provider in Europe. That's uh, going to be interesting. The so solar and en so energy storage together with big solar plants. And we then have the company called Blade Ranger, which is in robotics, and a further one, Chakratech in batteries, the further one in 
and others in truck net and uh, truck optimization. The key is these five are all either listed or being listed, going public. And there's the further four or five others we have, like Enervibe, which is energy from vibrations, currently piloting with a number of tire companies, revolutionizing uh, the future smart tires and effectively creating energy from vibration, which is a very interesting technology. The key here is that having invested in clean tech for a very long time, I'm now beginning to see that since the world of uh, climate change is starting to really ramp up, also in Israel, we have a phenomenal ecosystem in finding renewable energy and clean energy and climate change related technologies. So effectively, what we are now looking at is how to, and planet tech is quite important in that we're uh, looking to build a marketplace in uh, climate change as in planet tech. So the way we see it is to be a big, um, as, a, as CBG is going to promote technologies uh, globally, but particularly we think Israel has the possibility to, to put in a, a lot of its ecosystem is very much to the world of climate change and we could put together lots of technologies that will reduce global emissions. And I think uh, I have uh, developed a financial model that could in encourage G2G, government to government trading, capturing CO2 both for selling, uh, being able to sell in the markets uh, CO2 for uh, through the programs or voluntary credits or just in itself reducing CO2 but getting the measurement to be able to measure the amount of CO2 reduction is achieved by certain technologies, Israel can become uh, zero emissions very, very quickly. And I think if uh, what I've seen happen is Japan in around 2010, that area did a program with 50 countries. They exported uh, technologies around CO2 and managed to split the savings with 50 countries. So I think there is a possibility that we could build a platform that we could do government to government working big, big portfolio of climate technologies to which uh, one can export the technology to other countries and in theory, or maybe in practice, split the saving of CO2 between country A and country B. So that's uh, one element. Uh, so it's effectively government to government encouraging G2G and we can separately, what we see is having developed work in the healthcare industry we have now have a very good understanding, including uh, like the way to commercialize or make money is quite important in uh, climate change technologies because if you're not gonna make profit on it, it's very difficult for scale up. So the, that's why I'm encouraged with how we've achieved Capital Nature and its public companies. So we can replicate that across a number of Israeli incubators and VCs, which we have uh, maybe 20 different venture capital investments we've made. And I reckon a lot of our VC uh, general partners of VCs and incubators will have technologies that can pivot towards climate change. So the key for us is to build a dashboard that will show people what it means, climate change, what are we trying to achieve, whether it's agri-tech or food tech or clean tech or water tech, or there are so many different areas within uh, the whole area of technologies around the planet. But the key will be, can we find the technology, 
encourage the, the investment coming from effectively the governmental investment coming from the incubator programs, and separately seeing how to connect them to the likes of European funding, governmental funding, so we can encourage uh, finance together with collaboration with, uh, let's say, European companies, British companies, or American companies. And that collaboration will then lead to potential very large also listings on the stock exchanges. So effectively, it's not just uh, investing in companies that will not have much of a life on their own. So I can see the potential of a dashboard where uh, many, of, uh, many companies can be onboarded with their technology. We could show them we could drive the savings of CO2 on a global basis, look at how much it is, and then the key is to achieve the scale up where with the government helping and these type of programs, the measurement of how much global CO2 we were able to reduce as a consequence of our technology. Example of that is precision agriculture, where that was developed in Israel many 30 years ago, to which the effect of precision agriculture was enormous globally in the achieving in water, technology and food, etc. So if you replicate that, you could see how many technologies uh, can be, we can put together through the this particular climate program. So I think that's the idea. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chingiz, for the kind greeting. I'm sure that all of you are curious to know more about Planetech. Before we start exploring Planetech, I would like to tell you a story from my third year of studying environmental engineering at the Technion. I was sitting at the back of the classroom with two friends. We were reading a newspaper and saw a terrible picture of a nature reserve flooded with oil. This was the worst ecological disaster Israel has ever experienced. Five million liters of crude oil were spilled in a nature reserve in southern Israel. The spill affected people, wildlife and the natural environment in a catastrophic way. When we looked at the picture, we had two options. The first was to complain about it, speak about it during the coffee break, share posts about it in social media, and forget about the disaster. The second option was to take action. We chose the latter. A few days later, we were in the nature reserve collecting soil samples to take to the Technion labs. Fast forward a few months, we were the most dominant research group in Israel, including dozens of students, researchers, and governmental officials. We identified bacteria in the soil that could naturally digest the oil, developed new methods to evaluate the oil concentration in the soil, and laid the grounds for future research. Since then, I founded a startup, got married, joined a multinational water company, and had a baby. Today, at this event, we can imagine a newspaper with a picture of our planet. We all know that if we just zoom a little bit, we can find many cases where people, wildlife, and the natural environment are negatively affected due to climate change. And again, we have two options. The first is to complain about it, speak about it during a coffee break, and share a post about it in social media, and leave it at that. The second option is to take action. Today, I'm inviting you to take action with Planetech. Planetech is a joint venture of the Israeli Innovation Institute and Consensus Business Group. The Israel Innovation Institute is a nonprofit organization promoting innovation communities in different sectors. Smart mobility, digital health, ag tech, desert technologies, and innovation management to solve global challenges. The institute includes more than 27,000 community members and nearly 2,000 startups, many of them from the climate tech ecosystem. Consensus Business Group is a leading UK-based investment group led by Mr. Vincent Chengiz, with investments of over $400 million in Israeli technologies, funds, incubators, and other initiatives. The group's key areas of investments in Israel are in the healthcare, life science, climate change technologies, and HLS sectors. I would like to thank our partners for having the vision of Planetech and making it a reality.
Planetic was founded to serve as a global network of innovators that promote climate change technologies. We are located in Israel, a country with great startups and technologies, but are operating globally and we're inviting people from the whole globe to join us. We all know that climate change is an immediate threat with major risks, but it also offers exciting business opportunities. It's no longer a place only for those who appreciate nature or care about the environment. It has become an arena for startups, massive investment, and success stories of entrepreneurs. We expect to see a dramatic shift over the next few years and to have more innovators and companies that focus on technologies to make our economy carbon free. When you think of climate change technologies, you probably have in mind solar panels or wind turbines, which are indeed part of the technologies that our planet can benefit from. But these are only part of a much bigger picture. Regenerative agriculture, improved food systems, alternative proteins, green buildings, sustainable mobility, advanced materials, waste technologies, and other fields of innovation are all part of the technologies that can tackle climate change. And that's not all. We must not forget the ecosystems that have the highest potential to remove carbon from the atmosphere and can use innovation to do so. I'm talking about the natural environment. Preventing wildfires and restoring forests, managing oceans and inland water in sustainable approach, and predicting extreme weather events are an important part of the solution. As a nonprofit community, we provide knowledge and opportunities in the field of climate change, connect between a variety of stakeholders in different countries, and support implementation of technologies in a real environment. We will form workshops, cross-sectorial working groups, and build events showcasing the latest trends in the field. In our online communities, you can already interact, connect, and find potential partners for your journey. We will bring multinational organizations and countries together with innovators to solve challenges and engage with investors that are looking for the next climate unicorn. Using open innovation methods, we will build living labs to provide opportunities for startups to pilot and implement their technologies within large organizations. We invite entrepreneurs, startups, investors, researchers, governments, and any individual who would like to join us on our mission to become part of our community. We want to hear your needs, your thoughts, and your ideas to build this together. In this mission, we need everyone on board. We're moving to the second part of the event, hearing from our speakers. I'm handing over to Omer. Hello everyone, my name is Omar Topaz. I'm the community manager of Planetech. I'm honored to introduce you to the amazing speakers we have with us today, who will share the insights about climate change technologies in their countries. I would like to invite our first speaker, the special representative for climate change of the United Kingdom, Mr. Nick Bridge. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to the innovation community about the UK and our role in climate change. We've got the enormous uh, and humbling responsibility this year in 2021 of hosting COP26, the major UN climate conference, five, now six years because of COVID after the Paris Agreement. And the purpose of COP is for every country in the world to come together and commit to implement the Paris Agreement and deliver more ambitious domestic strategies that can uh, reduce emissions everywhere across every sector of all of our economies in a way that can limit the rise of uh, global temperature. The two uh, major features are to for everyone to set a long-term net zero target and a near-term 2030 uh, target that can deliver that net zero target and secondly to make sure that they're supporting the finance and the access to finance for the poorest and most vulnerable countries that are already experiencing uh, the impacts of climate to adapt and be more resilient to the challenges they face. Under the Paris Agreement, we've got net zero legislation, the first country, uh, adv major advanced country to have net zero legislation and the most detailed plan of anywhere across all of our sectors as to how to get there. Uh, at the end of last year, the Prime Minister in the UK announced a 10 point plan to drive a green industrial revolution. And if I just list the, the, the areas, they won't surprise you. Number one, uh, offshore wind. We are now the biggest producers of offshore wind in the world, and we're going to be powering uh, with enough electricity 
to power every home in the country uh, within a few years and have some more left over to power our industry just from offshore wind. We've come out of coal completely in the last few years. Second, hydrogen, really push the hydrogen uh, economy, a very big startup fund to help with that. Third around nuclear, small nuclear uh, modular reactors and through an advanced nuclear fund. Fourth, the zero emissions vehicles. We've ended the sale of combustion and diesel engines by 2030. So we're gonna be fully electric in the years following. Uh, fifth, more generally around public transport and investing in a zero public transport infrastructure. Six, aviation and shipping. We've got a, a jet zero uh, program and working with many other countries to push aviation and shipping, crucial industries. Seven, green buildings, things like uh, heat pumps and home standards to drive innov innovation and efficiency, including all those old uh, British houses. Eight, carbon capture, utilization and storage, CCUS, and industrial decarbonization, a huge opportunity for us. Nine, around nature, land use, forestry, and our production of food. And finally, uh, and most interestingly for you, finance, green finance and innovation. Now, underneath all of that, we have a uh, UK research and innovation uh, uh, entity alongside government pushing six billion in UK uh, funding each year and catapults in, in some of our most highly innovative sectors to bring in the private sector and drive this transition. So we really hope that you can be part of that uh, effort as the UK takes its responsibilities forward in the years ahead. Thank you, Mr. Bridge, for sharing with us the UK's climate strategy and the plans for the COP26. I would like to invite our second speaker, the climate envoy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Mr. Marcel Berkelboom. Hello from the Netherlands. My name is Marcel Beukeboom. I'm the climate envoy of the Netherlands and I congratulate you on being part of the Planet Tech initiative. We know that innovation is going to be a crucial part of the transition to a cleaner world and a climate neutral 2050. But we also have to look at the broader system, at the context in which we do have our innovations. Henry Ford once said, if I would have asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses and we would still all be riding in horse carriages, maybe a little bit um, faster and more modern. So that is a lesson that we all have to take in. Um, innovation matters, but it takes place into a broader con context and we have to form partnerships to be successful in, in what we do. So partnerships with other disciplines, but also partnerships between countries, so we can learn from each other. The EU and the Netherlands have taken initiatives and made deals and made plans towards a cleaner and climate neutral world in 2050. For example, the EU Green Deal and in the Netherlands a climate agreement and a climate law. That is a long-term vision that gives us the stability to plan and to work ahead and to, ha to have our innovations being part of that broader context. But we also have to adapt along the way. Many of the jobs of the future do not exist yet, so we cannot plan for them. We have to learn along the way. One example of such a learning comes from the Netherlands. As you perhaps know, the Netherlands is a wet country and a lot of water flows into our delta. And long we have had the idea that we had to fight the water, keep the water out. But with the change in climate and the rising water levels, that was no longer the solution that was future-proof. So we made room for the river. Instead of fighting it, we worked with the river and we built with nature. And such a way of adapting and learning is a lesson for us all. We can do that in many contexts. Also in, in Israel, where perhaps you have to adapt to a change in climate because it gets hotter and you have to come up with solutions for that. I wish you good luck today and I wish you good luck in the future. And let us be partners towards that future. You can always call on us on the embassy or on the Israel Dutch Innovation Center. From the Netherlands, cold and white, I wish you a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berkelbaum, for the insightful words on how the Netherlands are dealing with climate change challenges. I would like to invite our third speaker, the European Union Ambassador to Israel, Mr. Emmanuel Adjofre. Shalom, Rikul Chen. 
I'm happy to attend the launch event of uh, Planet Tech, a new interesting initiative that aims to bring together green tech communities in Israel, Europe and beyond, just two weeks after Tu Bishvat. The European Union is highly interested in cutting-edge technologies that can help preserve our planet. Given the importance of green tech for the startup nation and for the European Union, as well as the successful and mutually beneficial cooperation for over 25 years in research and innovation between the European Union and Israel, initiatives such as Planet Tech are very interesting to us. They could increase synergies among our innovation ecosystems, notably in one of the areas of high priority for the European Union, such as climate change, and in particular its technological components. Technologies for climate change, uh, so-called clean tech, were also at the core of a recent EU-funded study trying to understand and unlock the potential of EU-Israel cooperation in this field. Over the past year, the European Union has been leading the global fight against climate change. We have adopted a number of initiatives such as the European Green Deal, which sets as the objective to become climate neutral by 2050. In addition, the European Union is finalizing the design and launch of Horizon Europe, the next framework program for research and innovation, covering the period of 2021 to 2027, where climate and environment will have a prominent role in terms of funding, opportunities, for new technolo technologies to reach the market faster and for impacting rapidly on growth and job creation. We know the Mediterranean region is facing huge climate-related challenges and vulnerabilities, such as extreme weather events like heavy rainfalls provoking aggressive floods, longer and more frequent heat waves, increase of desert areas, or the rise of the sea level. Global warming is already, is already causing major distress to the Israeli economy and infrastructure. No economy in the world can afford such events on a re regular, massive and prolonged scale. Climate change is also a security threat. This is why we need to work collaboratively and invest on new technologies helping to find innovative solutions to climate crisis. Today's launch event is another step in this direction. Thank you, Mr. Gioffre, for the interesting overview of the EU's climate activities and the European Green Deal. I would like to invite our fourth speaker, CEO of State of Green from Denmark, Mr. Finn Mortensen. Thank you very much for inviting me to address you today. It's a great honor for me to participate in this important launch event. But please allow me to say a few words about the organization I represent, State of Green, before I move on to my speech. State of Green is a public-private partnership, not-for-profit, jointly owned by the Danish government and the four leading business organizations in Denmark. Our job is to share Danish experiences over the past 50 years with the Green Transition and to foster relations with international stakeholders just like yourselves. And I truly believe that we do have a lot to share in common. Back in 1973, when the first oil crisis hit the world, Denmark was totally unprepared. Being a small country, today less than 5.8 million people, we had no natural resources at the time, and we were almost fully dependent on imported oil for energy purposes. Consequently, the overnight spike in oil prices came as a total shock and brought the Danish economy to a virtual standstill. Denmark's foreign debt soared, unemployment went up, and it dawned upon the politicians at the time that Denmark needed, first of all, to diversify its energy supply. Concurrent with that, we needed to focus on energy efficiency and last but not least, 
also start looking at renewable energy sources, in particular wind, but not restricted to wind. The politicians at the time uh, took a new initiative. They started using what we popularly call the stick and carrot method to curb energy consumption in Denmark. First of all, high taxes on all kinds of fossil fuels, but at the same time also economic subsidies to citizens and companies who invested in energy savings measures. Seen in hindsight, I think it's fair to say that these far-reaching initiatives back in the 1970s sowed the seeds for the subsequent green transition in Denmark. It all started there. We realized as a nation that resources are scarce, be it energy or water, for instance, and as public perception gradually changed and accepted the new norm, we could call it, it also became easier for the politicians to uh, secure public acceptance of rules and regulations to safeguard the environment and the climate. Since then, we have come a long way. Today, almost half of Denmark's total electricity consumption is wind generated, and we have much bigger ambitions. By 2030, in nine years' time, we will have reduced our CO2 emissions by 70% compared to 1990, and by 2050, all energy in Denmark will come from renewables. Thank you, Mr. Mortensen, for sharing with us the story behind Denmark's green transformation. We are heading back to the third part of our event, the questions you asked our speakers. Handing back to Uriel. Climate change action is needed right now. There are technologies that are ready to scale and can have a significant impact on our capability to mitigate and adapt to climate change. We asked our speakers which mature technologies do they think can be implemented immediately. On the 25th of June 2020, the European Union gathered almost 800 people in person and online under the framework of the Climate Policy Forum, which was a high-level interactive event with the aim of exploring EU-Israeli climate-focused priorities and collaborations opportunities. High-level speakers included Maria Gabriel, the European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth, Minister Gila Gamliel, Minister Itzar Shai and Chemi Perez. The forum provided a timely and unique opportunity to reflect on the pressing need for the world to accelerate climate action efforts, supporting a global green recovery underpinned by the twin transition objectives of energy and technology. The event allowed for a focused discussion on how the European Union and Israel can maximize cooperation to respond to this challenge by harnessing innovation and green technologies. A number of mature clean technologies are currently deployed to support energy transition, sustainable agriculture and smart mobility. Whereas energy transition technologies are becoming affordable, we need more R&I to complete the decarbonization of the sector. For example, new concepts such as hydrogen-independent valleys may lead to the future of the second generation of our energy grids. Sustainable agriculture is a key component of the European Union's Green Deal, and R&I will be instrumental in finding new solutions, which will be good for the planet, but also for the industry. This is a very promising area for R&I usual cooperation and is underpinned by a new multidisciplinary and technologies-driven focus, recognizing the role to be played by an ecosystem effort. Smart mobility is at the core of several initiatives to make our cities greener, while disruptive innovation and new paradigms will help to drive how such ambitious goals are achieved. Ongoing cooperation between the European Union and Israel can open up new opportunities in this direction. With Green Deal goals for transport to become drastically less polluting, there is a need to radically reduce transport-related greenhouse gases emissions. 
underpinned by RNI technologies. Across all areas of green tech, civil society engagement is imperative in supporting the transition towards a carbon neutral future. We have to think of solutions in smart mobility. Not only think of improving cars that we already have, but also think about the combination of technologies. How can we integrate bicycling or walking into the smart grids that we design? We have to think about smarter buildings, greener buildings. Um, energy efficiency will be key to a greener future. And of course, resource efficiency and the circular economy. Those are the kinds of solutions that are readily available and help us to prevent the use of energy. Because the greenest form of energy is always the energy that is not used. Many of these solutions are available are available in the Netherlands, are available in Israel, and can be scaled up immediately. Often it is about a smarter way of thinking. And smart thinking is what, what both the Netherlands and Israel are very good at. Let's partner on this. So in terms of the mature technologies where the UK is already a, a center for innovation and investment, an obvious one is around offshore wind, where we are the global hub and the biggest offshore wind producer in the world, along with many near neighbors in, in Europe. Other areas include waste to energy, um, solar energy, and the entire ecosystem of mobility, our transportation systems, but also delivering the clean energy into those systems and the storage around those systems where our buildings and our vehicles become storage uh, facilities and all of it is renewable and clean energy driven and electrified. So a, a lot of new areas uh, over the recent years that are already becoming a, a critical mass and going to scale in our economy. Even if you look at some of the mature technologies that could be implemented immediately, we have uh, challenges in Denmark. Just to mention one example could be uh, the fact that as a nation we lag behind when it comes to electrification, at least compared to many other countries. Compared to these countries, for instance, we have far too electric vehicles in Denmark. There are several explanations for that. We do not have the necessary charging infrastructure as it is, but most importantly, it's also a tax issue. The Danish national budget relies heavily on income, for instance, from registration tax on vehicles, just to mention one example. And uh, therefore, a swift move to electric vehicles would create a big hole in the government coffers. Nevertheless, Danish politicians acknowledge the fact that we need to move down that path. And only a couple of months ago, they agreed on an ambitious goal of 1 million EVs in Denmark by 2030, which will require huge investments. Other Danish challenges relate to agriculture and buildings. This is the same also for a number of other countries, but in Denmark it, also, it is also high on the political agenda. We need to reduce our CO2 emissions here, but as you know, all regulation comes at a price. The global pandemic, the coronavirus, has been high on the political agenda and will remain there for a while, uh, for good reasons. However, climate change does not go away and we need to act. Many technologies that will be needed for the decarbonization of our economy are not yet ready for implementation and still require innovation and growth. We asked our speakers which technologies, in their opinion, will have an impact in the future. In terms of what's still got to come down the track, we've got to get carbon capture and uh, utilization of that carbon and storage of that carbon right. We've reinvested in a new phase of CCUS in the country, and that's actually uh, to capture the uh, emissions from energy, but even more so from industry and manufacturing. We are developing zero uh, clusters, industrial clusters, and CCUS, the capture and utilization and storage of carbon is an absolutely critical part of any scenario globally that gets us 
to um, tackling uh, climate change. We have to take that um, carbon out of our energy systems, out of our mobility and out of our industry. So that's a huge focus for the UK. Also aviation and shipping. These are sectors that were not in the Paris Agreement and we, we need to really double down quickly to make sure that our trading system, our global trading system, which can drive renewed prosperity and wealth uh, are compatible with the net zero trajectory. So we've got a lot of investment there. And I think the whole question of advanced materials is fascinating. We are trying to link uh, a climate change imperative with uh, an ecosystem and a biodiversity and a nature imperative. We have to generate sustainable um, ways of producing our food, living our lives. So I think the whole advanced manufacturing uh, system, advanced material system is gonna be critical as well. In that respect, it is also important and worth looking at some of the technologies that undoubtedly will have a big impact in the future. Carbon capture could be mentioned as one of them. Power to X is another. Just like in many other European countries, Power to X has attracted much attention in Denmark over the past year or so. Less than a month ago, a Danish consortium uh, announced that they will shortly initiate a project aimed at combining uh, an offshore wind turbine directly with electrolysis, uh, with an electrolyzer and transporting the renewable energy to shore. This is just one example of a number of projects underway in Denmark. So we are looking ahead and into some of the future uh, solutions. Innovation and new technology, such as green hydrogen, 100% CO2 free, as produced from renewables, and blue hydrogen, where the CO2 released in the process of grey hydrogen production is largely captured and stored at the level of 80 to 90%. These technologies are going to have a progressive and massive impact in the future. With its communication of 8th of July 2020, the European Union sets out a vision of how we can turn clean hydrogen into a viable solution to decarbonize different sectors over time, installing at least 6 gigawatt of renewable hydrogen electrolyzer in the European Union by 2024 and 40 gigawatt of renewable hydrogen electrolyzers by 2030. Hydrogen, which can be used as a feedstock, a fuel or energy carrier and storage, will help to decarbonize industrial processes and economic sectors where reducing carbon emissions is both urgent and hard to achieve. Most importantly, either it does not emit CO2 and does not pollute the air when used, or allow for CO2 about 90% capture and storage. It is therefore an important part, together with other technologies, of the solution to meet the 2050 climate neutrality goal of the European Green Deal. Technologies that will have an impact in the future are, in my opinion, technologies that address multiple crises at the same time. We have to deal with climate change, but also with the loss of biodiversity and desertification. We have to deal with scarcer resources and social crises, including a growing world population for which we have to find the space and the food. If you're able to combine those perspectives into one solution, I think you have the solution that is future proof. In the Netherlands, we always had to deal with too much water, but recently we also had to deal with drought. And for that, we didn't have all the knowledge in the Netherlands itself. So we looked across our borders as well. So we could learn from you, used as you are to work with a drier land. We have to think of solutions in dryland agriculture, smart climate, smart agriculture, but also in areas where we have to deal with wastewater uh, that we can reuse, for example. Those are the kinds of solutions that I'm thinking of when you ask me the question, what are the solutions for future challenges? You have knowledge, we have knowledge, and I think in the combination lies the way forward. We want to see the best climate technologies and companies joining the market. There is a pressing need for early support for startups and innovators to accelerate their businesses. We asked our speakers how their country can support early state technology implementation. Obviously, many of the new technologies being developed will require massive funding. 
in coming years. That's also high on the political agenda in Denmark. And a number of different funding programs are already available. The government has increased public spending on R&D. Others will be strengthened in coming years. The European Union is ready to engage, and is in fact already engaging, with partners around the world to direct investment to environmental sustainable economic activities, to share expertise, finance projects, share our experience and principles for sustainable finance. International alliances will be strongly beneficial to the development of this technology. The EU supports early stage technologies through a series of initiatives and instruments such as the full access to demo sites, pilot lines and also technology infrastructures. Access to those facilities are available for all innovators and companies who want to test their IPs and ideas and can receive a number of services including regulatory support and market intelligence. Those facilities are open to businesses from the European Union, but also from associated countries to the Horizon 2020 programs and in the future Horizon Europe, such as Israel. The European Innovation Council will also be instrumental in accelerating early stage technologies to access the market rapidly and in compliance with regulatory frameworks. While the European Innovation Council is still in pilot mode, there is clear emerging evidence of its added value in a number of key areas, which are strongly aligned to a climate-resilient transformation. Support to visionary entrepreneurs has been significantly boosted by the launch of a dedicated 300 million EAC accelerator Green Deal projects called last year, with the aim of transforming innovation to jobs and growth. Israel is among the most successful countries in the EIC pilot, and this makes our cooperation stronger and in line with mutual interest. Well, the UK uh, has been a fantastic hub of global science and basic research and development uh, for centuries, but we are really working hard on then taking that into commercialization and working with small innovative companies to uh, take uh, new technologies to scale. Our Prime Minister calls this the Green Industrial Revolution. Having started the original Industrial Revolution with coal, we're now trying to be at the heart of the next Industrial Revolution with a net zero transition. We have a major arm's length uh, government body called UK Research and Innovation, which has a, an annual spend in, a seed spend of around £6 billion which then is multiplied with a great deal of private sector uh, investment across the whole array of, of science and innovation. Uh, we also trigger investment, particularly in areas like offshore wind in energy systems with what we call a catapult process where we cluster in, in an industrial area and we build out from that area to go uh, across the country and across the world in, in the case now of our offshore wind offer. So there's lots of opportunities to get involved with a variety of uh, innovation funds uh, in the UK uh, uh, ecosystem. In order to act quickly and reach net zero industries, private sector participation is crucial. We asked our speakers which industry from the private sector in their country is most ready to implement technologies. There are many challenges and opportunities here, including addressing the green infrastructure investment gap and accelerating the EU's investment toolkit for climate finance. For example, the European Investment Bank, the European Investment Fund and InvestEU mechanism. The EIB is already depicting itself as a green bank. In turn, this is creating a new momentum for upgrading the ways in which our global innovation communities work together across science, research, investment and industry. Certainly, industries of the energy and the mobility sector are quickly advancing towards a rapid implementation of mature technologies. I'm thinking, for example, of smart grids using smart meters, which are now a reality in many EU member states. Electric cars are also slowly but constantly becoming more affordable and thus ready for mass uptake. Some EU member states made ambitious plan for phasing out polluting cars and stop petrol cars in the next two decades as part of the zero carbon 
national targets. Which areas of the private sector uh, are investing in the UK? It's really across the whole economy because we have a net zero uh, legislation in our government and in our economy. So every sector, the big emitting uh, energy uh, system, that has been a huge focus in recent years, coming out of coal and going into renewables, which is now often the majority of our electricity supply on, on many days. We have uh, in the area of industry and infrastructure, uh, so whether it's heavy uh, industry, advanced manufacturing, or investment in our infrastructure, all of that has to go at net zero. Across into transportation, uh, our uh, systems of uh, mobility, uh, trains, vehicles, trucks, cars, all of that are now uh, well on the way to a net zero trajectory. And then buildings, including heating, um, and looking at hydrogen, looking at heat pumps. We're aiming for um, over 600,000 heat pumps to go in in the next uh, seven years or so. So really across every sector of the economy, there's going to be huge opportunities to crowd in major private sector investment. Private investors also seem ready to support early stage technology implementation, be it within energy or water. Lastly, our mission is to build a community that can become a global network for climate innovators. We asked our speakers how they would suggest Planet Act, act to promote climate change technologies. Well, in terms of how Planet Tech and this innovation community can engage, I mean, the thing you've heard me say is that this is a whole of economy transformation. And so I would encourage uh, you to be thinking about uh, energy systems, uh, systems of transportation, the built environment in industry, in agriculture, in water, but also the system change that underpins a net zero economy. So this is about big data, it's about digital, and if you're thinking about changing to electric vehicles, it's not just the charging stations or the vehicles themselves, it's the batteries, it's the source of the energy, it's the grid that can carry that new smart data around the system. So I think that holistic systems approach is something that we want to advocate and that our innovation um, ecosystem tries to support. There's also a strong uh, uh, devolution opportunity here. A lot of smaller players and disruptive players coming in and they can be active right across the country. So our offshore wind revolution in the UK actually has regenerated previously declining industrial zones in Yorkshire, in Scotland, in Wales, more than even in some of the more prosperous areas. So this is for everyone everywhere. The European Council agreed to raise the bar and set the goal of reducing European Union's emission by 55% compared to the 1990 level by 2030. We have very ambitious goals and putting them into practice will be challenging from a policy, distribution, innovation and technology perspectives. Umbrella organizations and new networking facilitators such as Planetech in close cooperation with companies, policy makers and civil society can play a key role in advancing towards carbon neutrality. The generation of new knowledge generated through research and innovation will pave the way towards new technologies to help the transition. But at the same time, new ambitious regulatory frameworks and public-private partnership are needed to set the scene and push for deployment. Decarbonization has to accelerate in all industries and sectors across Europe and its neighborhoods. Green technologies are covering many sectors of the economy and the EU and Israel cooperation across them can only advance for mutual benefits in making the Paris targets and the EU goals of carbon neutrality achievable and, at the same time, instrument of growth and social inclusion. Let me conclude by thanking the Israeli Innovation Institute for organizing today's important launch event. I think uh, the promotion of climate change technologies that create both economic and environmental value is ever more important and will be extremely important also in the future. Knowledge sharing is one key element in this respect. And from our side, from State of Green's side in Denmark, I can assure you that we will be happy to pursue the dialogue in the, in the common interest of all of us. Thank you once again for arranging today's launch event. 
I'm very humble and uh, inspired to be able to participate. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our speakers for their insights, which help us to better understand what the most exciting opportunities in countries for climate change technologies are. And I would like to thank all of you for participating in our first ever event. I invite you to join our community and learn about the next events, opportunities, and trends in the field of climate change. Thanks again to our partners, speakers, and Planetex team. See you soon. Thank you.